Hello, everyone from um, Geneva, from WHO headquarters. My name is Tariq Yasharevic, and I welcome you to the regular COVID-19 press conference. Uh, I will introduce you to speakers who are uh, here with us today. Uh, with us is Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, Technical Lead COVID-19, Dr. Mike Ryan, who is Executive Director of WHO Program for Emergencies, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, WHO Chief Scientist, Dr. Bruce Aylward, Senior Advisor to the Director General and the Lead on ACT Accelerator. We also have with us Dr. Uh, uh, Rogerio Gaspar, who is the Director of Regulation and Pre-Qualification. Uh, also with us is Dr. Uh, Liviu uh, Vedrasco, who is a unit head, Country Simulation Exercises and Reviews. Uh, we also have uh, the Legal Counsel, uh, um, Derek Walton, online. There is a, also a special guest uh, uh, today that we mentioned in our media advisory that Dr. Tedros will uh, specifically introduce in his opening remarks. Uh, for journalists who are online, uh, please uh, click raise hand uh, so you get in line to ask a question and if possible ask only one so we can get as many as possible. Uh, as always, uh, this press briefing has simultaneous interpretation in six UN languages plus Portuguese and Hindi so you can use those languages to ask your questions. With that, uh, I'll give a floor uh, to Dr. Tedros for opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Tariq, and uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. 22 months since the first case of COVID-19 were reported, and almost a year since the first vaccines were approved, reported cases and deaths from COVID-19 are increasing again. More than 5 million deaths have now been reported, and we know the real number is higher. We are still losing more than 50,000 of our sisters and brothers every week. Last week, 56 countries from all regions reported an increase in deaths from COVID-19 of more than 10 percent. We hear reports from many countries about lack of ICU beds, lack of supplies, overwhelmed health workers and hospitals deferring other needed procedures. Let me be very clear. This should not be happening. We have all the tools to prevent transmission and save lives. And we continue to call on all countries to use those tools. Yesterday, we added another new tool with the emergency use listing of Covaxin the AIDS vaccine to receive WHO validation for safety, efficacy, and quality. Emergency listing contributes to vaccine equity by enabling countries to expedite their own regulatory approval to import and roll out vaccines. We encourage all vaccine manufacturers who have not yet received emergency use listing to contact WHO to discuss how to accelerate the process through rolling submissions. We continue to call on manufacturers of vaccines that already have WHO emergency use listing to prioritize COVAX, not shareholder profit. We continue to hear excuses about why low-income countries have only received 0.4 percent of the world's vaccines. One is that low-income countries can't absorb vaccines. That's not true. With the exception of a, new, a few fragile, conflict-affected and vulnerable countries, most low-income countries are ready to go. The problem is simply that they cannot get the vaccines. I repeat, they cannot get the vaccines. Another excuse from manufacturers is that low-income countries have not placed orders for vaccines. Most low-income countries are relying on COVAX, which has the money and the contracts to buy vaccines on their behalf, but manufacturers have not played their part. We still don't know when the manufacturers will deliver. We continue to call on all manufacturers to prioritize their contracts with COVAX and the Africa Vaccines Acquisition Trust, or ABAT. 
No more vaccines should go to countries that have already vaccinated more than 40% of their population until COVAX has the vaccines it needs to help other countries get there too. No more boosters should be administered except to immunocompromise people. Most countries with high vaccine coverage continue to ignore our call for a global moratorium on boosters at the expense of health workers and vulnerable groups in low-income countries who are still waiting for the first dose. We cannot end the pandemic without vaccines, but vaccines alone will not end the pandemic. Vaccines do not replace the need for public health and social measures. They complement them. Physical distancing, avoiding crowded spaces, masks, ventilation, hand hygiene, and other effective public health measures remain important in every country. Every country must continue to adjust and adapt its strategy. To support countries to do that, WHO has developed a tool called the Intra-Action Review, which countries can use to evaluate what's working and what's not. More than 100 intra-action reviews have now been conducted by 68 countries. Several countries have conducted multiple reviews, including South Africa, which has done 10, making it a central component of its response. Several key lessons emerge from these reviews. The need for strong and active national leadership at the highest levels, flexibility and adaptability by adjusting and repurposing existing systems, guidelines, and resources, multi-sectoral cooperation, and in the case of vaccine rollout, the need for adequate cold chain capacity and real-time monitoring of vaccine stock. Ending the pandemic as rapidly as possible must remain the central focus for every country. At the same time, we owe it to those who have lost their lives to this virus to learn the lessons it's teaching us and take whatever action is necessary to prevent a future disaster on this scale. The world was not prepared for COVID-19, and we knew we were not prepared. In 2018, WHO and the World Bank formed the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, the GPMB an independent panel of experts to identify gaps in the world's defenses and make recommendations on how to close them. We did not know then when the next global crisis would arise or what it would be, but we knew that disease X would come eventually. The GPMB published its first report in September 2019, just months before the pandemic hit. It identified many of the vulnerabilities that COVID-19 has exposed and exploited. The lack of political leadership and commitment, the lack of health system readiness, the lack of trust with communities, and the lack of international cooperation. The second GPMB report released in the middle of the pandemic last year incorporated hard-won insights with calls for predictable and sustained financing equitable access for vaccines and other life-saving tools, and global governance for preparedness. The GPMB published its third report last week. Instead of making more recommendations, the GPMB is calling the world to act on the recommendations it has already made, which are more relevant now than before the pandemic, but on which there remains little action. We have no shortage of reports, reviews, and recommendations, but we have a shortage of action. It's clear what needs to happen. Better governance for global health security, including a binding treaty on pandemic preparedness and response. Better financing to strengthen the capacities of all countries, especially the most vulnerable better systems and tools to prepare for, prevent, detect, and respond rapidly to outbreaks with epidemic or pandemic potential, and a strengthened, empowered, 
and sustainably finance WHO at the center of the global health architecture. To say more about its latest report, I'm delighted to welcome my friend and brother, Mr. Al Hajj Asi, the GPMB co chair and the former Secretary General of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Asi, thank you for your leadership, and you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, my brother. I think I could build on uh, one of the very powerful sentences that you just used. We need action. We already know what we need to do. What we need is action, and action now. Action now because the window of opportunity is closing by the day. So we need that urgency, and we need you know, ambition. You are absolutely right. Report after report, what we predicted happens. And we were congratulated to be right. And those were moments where it is not nice to be right. What is it, you know, that we know what's going to happen and we're smart enough to predict it and not smart, smart, smart enough to take the action required from preventing the outbreaks from becoming pandemics from preventing shock, you know, to become disasters. You mentioned the numbers. 17 million COVID-related deaths. Millions of people have lost their lives. Millions more are without parents or grandparents. Well, to put it like we feel in the region I am now, let me just say bluntly, it is deeply shameful. We should grieve. We should be angry because millions of deaths is neither normal nor acceptable. And these are just numbers that we're quoting and we forget that behind each unit of these numbers, there is a face, there is a human being, there is a story, a story of a parent, of a child, of a friend, of a colleague, many of them. So we have lost in our ourselves, you know, being on the front line and trying to respond to this challenge. The rift between haves and the half nots is growing. And you're right, it's not just vaccine equity that should be front and center. It is also a matter of how low income countries are able to implement public health measures within their communities and fragile economies to keep people safe. We are indeed facing extraordinary challenges and the world is clamoring for solutions. Yet global leadership continues to step back and shy away from what needs to be done. We've seen it happen once again with the recent G20 leader statement. Honestly, we had hoped for firm financial commitments to fully fund global efforts to curb the pandemic. We had hoped for an agreement to establish a financing mechanism that would provide predictable financing at the scale required to prevent further future pandemics. But what we got was the commitment to keep talking about it. We shouldn't be surprised. The world has exposed the world, you know, that is COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the world that is unequal, divided, in many instances unaccountable. Through the pandemic, polarization, geopolitical conflicts, nationalism, and skepticism of multilateralism have meant that many countries are raising the drawbridge rather than seeking global solutions. We shouldn't be surprised, but we should be dismayed. And we must demand more. We need to see signs that political leaders are willing to work together, all political leaders and take the bold steps that are urgently needed to protect the one and only planet we share, as well as the one and only humanity we share. In our report, we have challenged world leaders to take five steps, only five, that would demonstrate their commitments to change and how they will go about it urgently, inclusively, and equitably. 
five simple steps over the next eight weeks that will give a clear signal to the world that they agree on what needs to be done and are very serious about doing it. Let me spell them out. First, agree at the November 2021 special session of the World Health Assembly on the need to adopt an international agreement on pandemic preparedness and response and establish a process for taking forward negotiations. Second, agree to convene a summit of heads of states and government on pandemic preparedness and response together with other stakeholders and set in motion a preparatory process for this summit. And I emphasize here, together with other stakeholders, because we've been experiencing a multidimensional problem that will require a multi-sectoral approach and solution. Third, agree to significant increase in WHO assess contributions in order to adequately and sustainably finance the organization's essential functions and core capacities. Year in and year out, WHO has been weakened by less financing, less authority, yet if things are not working, the fingers are being pointed towards WHO. That has to change. Fourth, agree to establish a new financial intermediary fund for pandemic preparedness and response. And finally, develop terms of reference for the design of an end-to-end -end mechanism for research, development, and equitable access to common goods. Is there a hope? Yes. After years of inaction, we are finally, finally seeing some traction on climate change. World leaders gathered in Glasgow this week at COP26 are taking political responsibility and making commitments for change. The current political context is challenging, but there are some signs of progress. Pandemic preparedness and response should be a simpler problem in comparison. So why is it so difficult to get world leaders in a room to agree on the bold solutions required? If COVID-19 is not the catalyst for change, what will it be? It is easy to be cynical today and think that nothing can change, that we are forever condemned to repeat the cycle of panic, apathy, and neglect. But we must reject pessimism and recognize our common humanity and growing interdependence. We must recognize that we live in a shared world with shared risk and shared responsibilities. The solutions must match the magnitude of need to bring this pandemic to an end and to prepare for the next one, and even better prepare for the next one. And we must support those individuals and organizations working tirelessly to end this epidemic. Many of them, or some of the most important of them gathered in this room today, were indebted to you, my brother, Dr. Tedros, and to the WHO for the leadership you continue to show in working towards a global health ecosystem that serves everyone, everywhere. And that is the spirit you know, in which you know, this report you know, has been published. And more than a report, it should be incentivizing action. And we continue our mobilizations in the frame of an independent framework to see things happening, action be taken, and accountability be shown. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, my brother Asi. I will quote you from what you said. If COVID is not the catalyst for change, what could it be? That's really true. And thank you for your clear call to action. And we can only hope that the international community acts on that call. As you said, we know what needs to happen. What we need now is action, urgency, and ambition. Thank you so much again for your leadership. Tariq, back to you. Um, thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, thank you, Mr. Asi. Uh, Mr. Asi will be with us uh, uh, throughout this press conference and uh, will be uh, available to answer some of your 
uh, questions. With this, uh, we will open the uh, floor for questions from uh, journalists who are online, and uh, we will start immediately with uh, Nina Larson from AFP. Nina? Yes. Hi, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, uh, as you mentioned, the world this week passed uh, the devastating milestone of 5 million officially registered COVID deaths since the start of the pandemic. Um, and at the same time, we're seeing uh, case numbers rising in many places, including Europe, uh, which now appears to be the epicenter of the pandemic again, as Dr. Kluge said today. As we approach the end of the year, I was wondering if you could say how you expect this pandemic to evolve into uh, 2022, if you think there is any chance at all the pandemic could be declared over next year, or are we instead looking at a worse thing, possibly even the doubling of this death toll? Thank you. Thanks very much for the uh, question. I'm, I will begin, and I'm sure others may want to come in. Um, I mean, the, I just I just hope that marking this tragic milestone doesn't become just that, that it's just another number um, that we reach. Uh, I don't think the world has even begun to grieve uh, this many deaths, and we know it's, it's far, far higher, and every single one of us on the planet has been impacted by this pandemic. The trajectory of this pandemic is in our hands. It has always been in our hands. Um, and your question about what will happen into 2022 uh, remains up to us. Um, is there a possibility where we can reach a state where we have gained control over transmission in 2022? Absolutely. Is there the possibility that we can remove the death, the severe hospitalizations and death in 2022? Absolutely. We could have done that already, but we haven't. And collectively, as individuals, as leaders, um, we have to take uh, stock of that and make a choice and make conscious choices every day of how we're going to address that. You ask about 2022, and, and it's a good question. We get that question a lot. But right now, we are seeing increases where we shouldn't be. You mentioned Europe. There's been a 50, more than 55% increase in cases over the last four weeks in Europe, where there's ample supply of vaccines, where there's ample supply of tools. And, you know, uh, we mention grieving and being angry and being frustrated. What we need to see is that anger, that emotion turned into action. We need actions that protect, protect ourselves, that protect our loved ones from infection, from the spread. We need leaders to provide communities with consistent, accurate information to enable communities to keep themselves safe and their loved ones safe to invest in systems and surge those systems for surveillance, for testing, to support our health workers. Um, it's happening now. We, we can't make these changes once this pandemic is over to prepare for the next one. One of the themes of today is these interaction reviews. And many countries have used this to assess where they are and to make necessary changes. And that is something we advise to countries, to regularly assess the epi situation, the severity of the situation in their country and the capacities that they have, and to course correct where needed. This is a strength. This is not a weakness of countries. So the question is not what we do in 2022, it's what we do right now. And we have the opportunity and we have to do this now. How many more people need to die? How many more countries need to be put into severe situations again before we take action? So everyone that's watching this, whether you're an individual, whether you're a journalist, and thank you for putting out good information through your networks, leaders, what will you do today? Um, Mr. El Hajj, uh, I see, would you like to add something on, on this uh, particular question on the prospects? Leonard, just to reinforce, I think uh, Dr. Maria von Karkov said it, you know, very nicely. It is the anger and the emotion should not paralyze us. It should lead, you know, to action. And that is the action, you know, that we all are hoping. Let's get inspiration, I think, from the thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on the front line who are confronted, you know, with this uh, 
challenges on a daily basis and doing their best to alleviate human suffering and to save lives. Let us think of you know, those who have hosted the virus in their own bodies, including myself, who are very, very sick and then uh, knowing what it means, you know, to have healthcare workers, you know, on your side and to know how an oxygen tastes, you know, to save your life. And all the things that we're talking about is not abstract. All these things we're not talking about are realities, you know, on a day-to-day -day that we are all facing and then confronting. So, um, again, we will continue think, to express, you know, this anger, to continue to express these emotions. But emotions means to be in motion, to be in action. And that is, you know, that partnership that we are calling for and will continue to, to do so every day. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. C. We will go now to next question, Shoko Koyama from uh, Japanese broadcaster NHK. Shoko, the floor is yours. Hi, sir. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, regarding COVAX, in which uh, WHO issued an emergency use listing yesterday, I was following the social life Q&A yesterday and heard the explanation on which strain has been used. I understood it is closer to the original strain, but not Delta strain, but didn't quite understand how WHO considers the effectiveness toward variants. So was it found to have 78% efficacy against COVID-19 of any civility, including Delta variant? And my second question, if I may, um, what impact do you consider this approval gives to increase the capacity of distribution with COVAX facility? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe Dr. Swaminathan may start, uh, and uh, also Dr. Rogeria can add. Yes, I can start. I'm sure Dr. Gasper will come in. So, um, yes, as you heard, the WHO um, did provide the emergency use listing yesterday to Covaxin. That's the latest, and uh, this process is ongoing. We have a rolling submission. We look at. Um, the committee looks at efficacy and safety data from all of the clinical trials and uh, also post-marketing uh, surveillance studies, as well as the manufacturing itself, the quality of the manufacturing. SAGE, which is the uh, independent uh, strategic advisory group of experts on immunization, also looks very carefully at the clinical trial data. So what uh, was said was that this vaccine, the Covaxin, uh, in its trial of about 25,000 uh, people, the phase three trial of uh, adults over eight, um, 18 years, uh, had an efficacy of about 78% against symptomatic infection. And at the time that the trial was being done in India, there was a lot of Delta. It was around the time that uh, the Delta uh, virus was becoming predominant virus. So in the trial, when they did the genotyping of the infected participants. They had people with uh, Delta infection. They also had people with uh, previous variants like Alpha. So when they looked at the subgroup uh, of Delta infection, they found that it also had a fairly good efficacy of uh, close to 70%. I think it was around 68%. So that's why um, the clinical trial um, data actually shows overall efficacy of 78%, a higher efficacy against severe disease close to 90%, but the number of cases were less. So that's why the confidence intervals are quite wide. And uh, they also were able to give an F estimate of the efficacy against uh, the Delta variant. Because some of the trials that were done for other vaccines were done at a time when the Delta was not the predominant variant. And then subsequent studies had to be done to, uh, to find out you know, the efficacy against a different variant. So it's always good to have that information as well from the uh, manufacturers. What uh, emergency use listing provides is a couple of things. One is that it enables countries to uh, regulatory agencies to approve very quickly based on the WHO EUL because they can, many countries go by, by the WHO EUL or pre-qualification. And therefore it provides opportunities for expanded use and access uh, of this product. Um, and it's basically a stamp of uh, safety, efficacy, quality, and, and hopefully it also enables people for uh, easier travel, uh, as many countries are looking at, uh, at vaccination certificates. Even though the WHO continues 
to uh, say that vaccine certificate should not be the exclusive criterion for uh, travel entry. Uh, Rogerio might want to add. So, thank you, Sumia. Uh, just to compliment, because I think you covered already part of the, the question, just to compliment on the procedure for approval, which was in the media with several questions in, in, in weeks before this one. And now the process is completed, we can go to the numbers and to the facts as we normally wish to do. So, the approval of the eight vaccines that were EUL'd since the beginning varied between 40 to 165 days. Specifically, Covaxin, uh, the Barat uh, vaccine, was submitted on 9th of July and approved on the 3rd of November, which means 120 days by the clock. But we, if we consider the relevant data that was submitted by the end of July, it's closer to 90 days in terms of the process of approval. I hope these numbers, which are transparent and they are on the website of WHO, as we normally do every week, uh, put an end to a number of questions that we have seen in the previous weeks. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, now we will go to the next question. That's uh, Donato Mancini from Financial Times. Donato. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, uh, Donato, sorry. can you just speak a bit louder? Hi, sorry. So I know, I know you've been asked about the trajectory of the pandemic in 2022, but what is your assessment of the situation in Europe currently, with cases rising, especially in Eastern Europe and in Benelux, where new restrictions are being imposed among other places? Thank you so much. So I can begin. I mean, I think, you know, as we are seeing cases and deaths uh, increase across uh, large parts of Europe, it's not just in Eastern Europe, but in many other countries as well, our recommendations are really to use the tools that you have to act fast, um, to use public health and social measures in addition to increasing vaccination coverage, um, and to tailor the response as locally as possible, um, understanding what the situation is, um, because it is diverse, and it's not the same. Uh, we don't give prescriptive information or, or uh, advice um, because the situation is so dynamic um, and capacities are also different. Um, and so our recommendation is to assess you know, where you are with the EPI, but when you're looking at cases, what we do see is in countries that have access to vaccine. The vaccines are incredibly effective against hospitalizations and against deaths. So you may see cases, case numbers increasing, but the deaths are not increasing at the same rate. Um, the fact that there still are people that are, are dying needs to also be addressed, of course. Um, and part of this is ensuring we have adequate vaccination coverage in all countries of those who are most at risk, people with underlying conditions, those who are over the age of 60, and critically, our frontline workers. But in addition to that, even if you are vaccinated, to continue with the public health and social measures. Continue to wear a mask, a well-fitting mask over your nose and mouth. Mask supplies are ample now. Um, and this is a, perhaps an inconvenience for some, but this is one of the proven measures that can limit the spread, in addition to physical distancing, avoiding crowds, working from home as much as you, as much as you can. Not everybody has that luxury. Um, and for leaders to really invest in, in surveillance and build up those capacities and systems right now. Um, it's about a combination of approach. It's not just vaccines, uh, it's vaccines and not vaccines only. Um, and so what we need for countries to do is to really stay the course. You've heard us say that before. And what that means is to apply a number of measures. Some people like the Swiss cheese anal analogy of building and layering upon and adjusting that and tailoring as needed, um, and we're here to support. Uh, we support through our regional offices, through our country offices, um, to help with supply if necessary, um, you know, to ensure that there's adequate clinical care, and uh, we will continue to do that. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Van Kirchhoff. Uh, we go to the next question, Gunilla Van Hall from Svenska Dagbladet. Uh, Gunilla, you have the floor. Uh, yes, can you hear me? <clears throat> uh, very well. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, it is about Europe and the situation, cases going up in Europe is now again, we heard today, epicenter of the pandemic. Um, at the same time, um, same week, we have the G20 in Rome, we have the climate summit in Glasgow with 30,000 participants. 
Um, how wise is this? Uh, how advisable is it to have big international meetings in person when we have this situation, especially in Europe right now? Thanks. Um, I, I think um, both of those um, gatherings that you, you mentioned had very strict protocols in place in terms of the, uh, the status that uh, the participants have had to demonstrate before attending those uh, conferences. And we've been supporting many um, uh, mass gatherings over the last uh, two years in, in, in trying to ensure that we can continue to gather safely uh, in reduced numbers virtually and increasingly face to face. Um, I, I, I do think, uh, though, that in referring back to what Maria has spoken about, the, the reality for, for Europe in, in general <clears throat> is that we've had that again, and it's, we're two years into this, but we seem to be constantly surprised by the, the simple behaviour of viral pathogens. Um, we have come out of a summer period with increased mixing, increased mobility, increased gatherings, a lot of restrictions have been reduced. The onus has been put back on individuals to continue individual risk management with little support from the uh, governments in, in being able to, <clears throat> to continue doing that. Temperatures have dropped. Uh, it's, the weather has disimproved. And, and people are moving back inside. Um, and they're doing that in two contexts. Um, in the context of um, countries that have relatively or very high vaccination levels in vulnerable groups, but transmission has been transferred into younger age groups, so you have intense transmission without necessarily uh, a huge increase in, 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 in hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and then you have other scenarios in which there's been relatively low vaccine uptake in some countries, and they're really facing into a very difficult situation because they have suboptimal vaccine coverage. And there are countries in Europe who have this. There may be plenty of vaccine available, but uptake of vaccine has not been equal. And uptake of vaccine, particularly amongst highly vulnerable groups. So when you look at coverage of vaccination in any country and say it's 60%, for me, I want to know which, who's covered. If you've got 95 or 99% of people over 65 with underlying conditions covered, then clearly you're not going to have the same risk. Uh, if, uh, if half of your vulnerable population are still not covered with vaccine, then they remain extremely vulnerable in a context of increasing intensity of transmission. Uh, the other factor I think that's not um, really, uh, I think, being considered is health systems have already been weakened by this massive effort over the last 22 months. Health workers are exhausted. Many health workers are leaving the profession. Um, uh, and um, hospitals around Europe were just getting back with doing elective work and the normal work, and now we're seeing country after country having to switch back to cancelling um, elective surgery or non-essential uh, medical interventions uh, and having to reprogram back to uh, shoring up their intensive care and their high support care. Uh, facilities. This is again putting a lot of pressure back on health workers. So even where we're not seeing the same increases in hospitalizations as we saw um, earlier in the year, the, the, a smaller number of cases is placing an even greater burden on the system because the systems are tired. The people in the system are tired. Um, they're still fighting very hard, but it's very hard to, for them to, to, to be able to react in, in the same way. It is very difficult to sustain the kind of effort that's needed on everyone's part, on the part of health workers, on the part of communities, on the part of government. There's exhaustion, and exhaustion is leading to complacency, and complacency is leading to gaps in our system, gaps in testing, gaps in clinical management, um, uh, gaps in vaccination. And it is through those gaps that we see transmission. It is through those gaps that we see the hospitalizations and the deaths. And we need to close the gaps we need to close the gap in vaccination. We need to close the gap in protected, safe, well-rested health workers. We need to close the gap in protecting ourselves and through public health uh, measures, as Maria has said, wearing masks and being cautious. Um, just because you're vaccinated does not mean you're perfectly protected against every outcome um, in, 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 in COVID-19. Uh, COVID so 
And, and you know, the numbers are, are also, deaths are also rising in other regions, and cases are rising in other regions, and, and uh, it, it's very important to reflect that Europe represents over half of the global cases in, in, the, in the last week. But that trend can, can turn. Look what happened. We're, we're all epidemiologists now. We, we only have to look at the roller coaster epidemiologic curve to know that when you're coming down the mountain, you're usually about to go back up another one. And uh, the fact that Europe is climbing that mountain again should really stand everybody up around the world and say, what are we going to do? Because uh, Europe does have the capacity, and European countries have the capacity. Uh, they have the va uh, vaccine access. They have the money. They have the, the systems in place that they can react. Many other regions don't necessarily have those capacities in place. So um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a warning shot for the world to see what's happening in Europe despite the availability of, 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 of vaccination. Um, and I think we all have to double down and recommit ourselves to doing everything we can to be the last person in the chain of a transmission. Uh, and uh, that's going to mean uh, I think ex increased use of, of, for example, things like antigen testing and expanded, changing the way, and we were discussing this this morning, sometimes uh, to stay the course, you have to change course. And at the moment, we seem to be hell-bent on a course that says the pandemic is over and we just need to vaccinate a few more people and this will all be over. That is not the case. We need to, and Maria spoke to this, each and every country now needs to look at its strategic preparedness and response plan for this pandemic. It needs to look at the gaps in the system that exist right now, and it needs to plug those holes in their response. Um, some countries are going to need a lot of assistance with that. Many European countries are well able to, uh, to deal uh, with that. And I know governments don't want to disappoint their populations by going backwards. Uh, and there's this perception that we're moving forwards now towards the end of the pandemic, and any step backwards is a retrograde step. I think every country now needs to look at its epidemiology, look at protecting its health workforce or its health system, uh, and ensure that it can get through the next few months without systems going into collapse again. And that will require, in, in, in many countries, a course correction uh, and a real focus on ensuring that every single vulnerable person is, has had uh, full vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Next question uh, is coming from uh, Mexico, Eje Mexico, and we have uh, Manuel Lino with us uh, online. Uh, Manuel, could you please uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, uh, well, I read that uh, an article in the BMG that says that who is needed no, now more than ever but is handcuffed by lack of funds and structure that leaves it vulnerable to politics. These problems can be fixed, uh, says the author, and must be done urgently. Uh, could you share some thoughts on this statement? Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, um, Mr. C could uh, start, as he was mentioning about uh, funding, and then we'll come back uh, to the room here. Mr. C. Yes, I personally have uh, witnessed in my professional lifetime you know, that uh, when we were confronted with a huge HIV epidemic, not enough was invested in WHO, but we created UNAIDS, and I worked for UNAIDS. I also remember very well you know, after the UNGAS in 2001, when we needed to invest more on AIDS, TB, and malaria, we did not invest more in WHO, but we created the global funds. Also witness, you know, when Gavi was created, when we needed to do more on immunization. And most recently, we saw the creation of Stop TV Partnership, Rollback Malaria Partnership. Maybe there is good intention behind all of that, you know, to call for a multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral response to this challenges you know that we see but at the end of the day if any of those sectors did not deliver and at the end of the day we had some problems and issues at the country level or at the local level fingers are be pointed at WHO so when we call for greater funding for WHO more support more 
accountability and more authority. This is not a favor that we are doing to WHO. It is you know, because we care about global health and we care about the support that is required and that needs to be given now to countries. We believe that a much stronger funded WHO with greater authority out of you know, the geopolitics positioning is the way to go. And that can also make the organization you know, more accountable and then we can all be you know, more demanding vis-a-vis you know, the organization. We only hope you know, that uh, with this current crisis, we do not repeat you know, the same, if not mistakes, but you know, the common practices. But again, let's try you know, to see outside of WHO what we can do and then continue to blame WHO if things are not working. So we strongly believe that uh, a stronger WHO, fully funded WHO with greater authority that comes with greater accountability is something that is required now and urgently. Um, I might just add to, to IC's uh, uh, comments. Um, uh, again, I would uh, put, when we speak about WHO as the World Health Organization against uh, some people uh, imagine that as a secretariat building in Geneva, Switzerland. The World Health Organization is effectively the combination of 194 member states around the world uh, who come together to agree on what priorities should be for health and what, and what policy should be for health. It is our work as a secretariat under the leadership of Dr. Tedros to implement those policies and implement the will uh, of, of countries in terms of what uh, countries consider to be the priorities uh, in terms of, of, of health. Um, uh, it's, uh, in my view, uh, the, the way we're, we're dealing with our transnational health issues at the moment is we're trying to deal with a, a global threat using individualized solutions. Uh, I was on a, 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 a foresight roundtable this morning and uh, Professor Alice Roberts, who many of you will know, was, was on that roundtable and uh, she's a medical anthropologist and communicator and said that we're effectively operating a, f a medieval feudal system where each country can build its own castle and pull up the drawbridge and that represents safety. That concept may have worked in medieval times. It doesn't work in the face of a globalized viral path pathogen. And it doesn't work when we talk about other issues in healthcare like HIV or TB or malaria. We need collective solutions. We need transnational and what would be called multilateral uh, solutions. We need uh, agreement at a global level on what is to be done to protect the health of the world's population, uh, health for all. Uh, you can't deliver health for all unless you prioritize health for all. And in when we talk then about putting more money into health, it's not about putting more money into WHO or more funding into WHO, it's about putting more funding into healthcare systems, into public health systems, into protecting health at local, community, national and global level. WHO can do its part, but the, the, the main investment here, and I'm sure Dr. Tedros would speak to this, is investing in universal health coverage, investing in public health systems at national level. Epidemics and pandemics begin and end in communities. The deaths we've seen in COVID have primarily been due to unmanaged underlying health conditions that people have uh, borne for years and years without proper access to health care, be it for financial reasons, ethnic reasons, many other reasons. So yes, there needs to be a massive scale up in funding. In the, in, the, in the space of health. Health is not a cost, health is an investment, uh, and uh, no more than with, uh, with, uh, with climate change. It cannot be addressed through single country responses. It can only be addressed when we all come together and invest in health and health for all. Uh, and in that sense, yes, I would agree that with, I see there, the, clearly WHO has a huge role to play in that, but the real gap here is investment in in health and healthcare systems and in health protection. Uh, many thanks, uh, Dr. Ryan and uh, Mr. Assi. Uh, we have a time for one, maximum two questions. We also want to hear at the end uh, from Dr. Uh, Liviu Ledrasco on the uh, on the interactive exercises on the preparedness. So uh, let's uh, go to John Zaracostas uh, from The Lancet. John. 
Yes, good afternoon on a cloudy Geneva day. Uh, my question is to some of the participants on the panel, and in particular, uh, Mr. Al Haj. You mentioned you would like to see an international instrument and for some guidance going forward on the negotiations. And Dr. Tedros also mentioned that. Can you please elaborate a little bit and make the case why it's so important, given you had the international health regulations negotiated at five, over five years and ignored in the first few months of the pandemic? So can you please make the case? And since Mr. al Hajj is there, I'd love his views also on the epidemic of indifference right now worldwide, on the catastrophic food insecurity in Madagascar, in Yemen, in Afghanistan. Thank you, John. Um, Mr. Asi. Thank you very much. Now, let me, uh, you know, go back, you know, to the uh, initial recommendations, you know, that were made that were based on the consultation of really what is lucky. And uh, we realized there are so many uh, instruments you know, already existing. You know, they cover certain areas and then work well for that purpose. You know, when we are now facing uh, a pandemic of an unprecedented magnitude, we will need responses and instruments, you know, that are at the same level and same scale, not only for this pandemic, but, you know, for similar cases that we will be confronting in the future. And many, like myself, believe that it is not a question of if, it is only the question, you know, of when. Now, we have already said that the world is in crisis. We say the world is fragmented. We say there is a lack of leadership. We say there is a lack of accountability. How can we, you know, make sure, you know, that uh, all those lacks, you know, that we're talking about can be remedied? And then we find systems and framework that is bringing people together, you know, for action, for monitoring, and for holding each other accountable. And that is the uh, reason why, you know, we are supporting pretty much that instrument, be it a convention, you know, be it a treaty, you know, that will be defining, you know, roles and responsibilities you know, of countries and include a high level monitoring framework of member states at the highest level, you know, to make sure that we hold each other accountable. If that is not defined in a form of a treaty that commit states, you know, to do something, then you don't have a basis upon which that accountability can also be exercised. And that is the reason why we're supporting it. And there are many activities already going on, or many negotiations, many discussions. This is not uh, in lieu of the IHR. This is not, you know, a substitution, you know, to, but it is an instrument that is, you know, much more transversal, you know, that we believe that will also reflect the multi-sectoral and multi-dimensional issue of the kind of problems you know, that we are talking about. A parallel discussion on the IHR is certainly happening to draw lessons you know, from what have been learned so far and then further strengthening it. We will be living in a world that is not gonna be a matter of either role or how these different instruments you know, will be complementing each other and taking it you know, to another scale. The issues that you are mentioning you know, in Yemen, in Madagascar and others, all that again, you know, has been revealed you know, by COVID-19. And when we talk about strong leadership, active citizenship, common humanity, finding solutions, you know, to the problems, you know, of the people on the ground, all that come together. And I think that is the reason why I was starting by saying an outbreak should not be a pandemic, a shock and a hazard should not be a disaster that could apply for food security, that could apply for the climate, that could apply also for epidemics. And I think. That is the common platform of leadership and accountability that is required. And it is pretty much illustrated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, many thanks, uh, Mr. C. Uh, maybe uh, as we are nearing the, the hour of this press briefing, uh, we could give a floor to Dr. Liviu Vedrasco to tell us more about uh, those interaction uh, reviews that have been uh, taking place in a uh, in number of countries um, that have been mentioned in uh, opening remarks. Dr. Vajasko. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Many speakers called for course corrections, course adjustment, 
and global action. And while perhaps it is difficult to prompt these actions at the global level, at the local level and subnational level, intra-action reviews do exactly that. They identify what needs to be corrected in a particular locality. And as Dr. General mentioned, a hundred interaction reviews have been done at country levels. And many countries found value in them and are repeating them. Ten interaction reviews in South Africa, many interaction reviews in New Zealand, and many other countries. Countries see value in targeted interaction reviews. They're looking at their vaccination efforts. They're looking at their crisis communication efforts. So I want to also commend many countries that are choosing to publish their interaction reports on their government portals. This promotes transparency, accountability, and sharing of their strengths and challenges with their populations and with their neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vagrasco. Just to uh, let everyone know that we have been also joined by uh, Dr. Landry Magigane, who works with Dr. Vedrasco in country simulation exercise and reviews. I don't know if uh, Dr. Landry would like to add something on this topic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Uh, it's just, again, to, uh, <coughs> uh, to reiterate on the need for continuous learning uh, because it's only when we are learning and we are able to identify where the gaps are and course correct and apply those lessons learned, this is the best way we can, uh, we can really address uh, this pandemic as quickly as possible. And, uh, and, and I believe interaction review can play a critical role in that. And I really urge countries, uh, as uh, Dr. Maria Vankerkov, uh, sorry, Dr. Maria Vankerkov mentioned at several occasions, we need really to learn and, uh, and, 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 and apply the critical lessons learned uh, as we move forward. Over. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Landry. Uh, so maybe be before I give a floor to, uh, to, to Dr. Tedros, uh, Dr. Ryan would like to add something. Just uh, on, the, on the, the issue of instruments and, and, and treaties, just uh, I, I'm sure people are aware of this, but uh, uh, the, the World Health Assembly will convene at the end of this month uh, with Dr. Tedros uh, for only the second time in its history in an extraordinary meeting to consider one issue, one agenda item and one agenda item only, and that is the, the need uh, for and the merits of uh, concluding a new agreement or framework treaty convention uh, that would allow the world to react uh, collectively uh, uh, in preparedness and response to, to the next uh, pandemic. That will be led by our member states, as I said in my previous intervention. Um, and it's going to be a very important uh, convening of all the member states of WHO with the Director General to consider that very, very question. And uh, um, I think it's a, a very, very important moment in the history of global uh, public health. And uh, as the Director General has said before, a, a generational moment to consider the future of pandemic preparedness and response. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. So I will just go back to uh, Mr. El Hajj Asi for any final remarks before uh, we give the floor to Dr. Tedros. Thank you very much. Just one final remark again to uh, thank WHO and uh, the World Bank for convening the GPMB and to stress again the importance of an, uh, an independent monitoring framework, you know, moving ahead with uh, all these uh, negotiations going on, all those ideas on the table, including a trade euro convention, and again, monitoring, calling for action, incentivizing for action, and holding people accountable. So the GPMB is committed to that, and we will be looking forward you know, to continuing working with all of you in that trigger. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your participation and very strong messages uh, today, uh, Mr. RC. Uh, with this, we will conclude the press briefing. The audio file will be sent shortly and transcript will be available tomorrow. Last floor is, uh, as always, for Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tariq. I, uh, I think it was a very important presser and thank you Asi for, for joining us and your message was very clear. 
we know what to do. Uh, now it's, it's time for, for action. I think um, that would be the best message to take from today's presser and um, uh, move uh, forward to take action. And the immediate being uh, vaccination. Um, as you know, we have set a 40 percent target uh, of vaccination for each and every country by the end of this year, and that's possible. So I would like to use this opportunity to call on uh, those who can afford to, to share uh, and also support in any other way, uh, and also cooperation from the manufacturers uh, to achieve the 40% uh, target. So I think that's um, a clear goal and uh, where our action should, should be focused among other things. Of course, the long term is key while fighting the pandemic now. We need to prepare for the long term. And that's why, um, as Mike said, we are now going to have a special session of the World Health Assembly at the end of this month to discuss uh, the, the need for a pandemic uh, treaty. Uh, this uh, pandemic has been really unprecedented. And if I will again quote uh, Asi, if this COVID pandemic cannot be a catalyst for change, it's very difficult to change to, to <laughs> understand what could be actually uh, a catalyst. Uh, so uh, that's why um, the treaty uh, the discussion or the assembly uh, to discuss the treaty is, is very timely, very crucial, and I hope the world will, will agree to have uh, um, a treaty or agreement that can help us to fight the next pandemic in a better, in a better way. So thank you so much again to ASI for your leadership, and thank you also to the media for joining us today, and uh, see you next time.